Well, uh, is there anybody here that didn't know George Thurman? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a couple that didn't know. So you're all pretty well familiar. I'll just go through this bio sketch of you know, George's life. <clears throat> he was born in Vancouver, BC, September 17, 1913. He went to the public school in River. There's a lot in between there that we did not cover. He went to a public school in Rivers, Manitoba for grades one and two. Brandon, Manitoba, grades three to eight. He went to high school in Brandon, Manitoba. University, Brandon College, now um, University of Brandon. He got a Bachelor of Arts in the spring of 1934. He went to the College of Education in Toronto from 1934 to 35. In 1935, he began teaching at Essex High School. In 1939, he came to the St. Thomas Collegiate Institute in St. Thomas. Two years later, he joined the Canadian Army at Brandon, Manitoba as a gunner in the 59th Field Battery. After five years, retired with rank of captain. He served in England and Italy. In 1945, he taught grades 11 and 12 in a high school for 5th Division in Groningen, Netherlands. In 1946, he taught first year university English at Khaki College in England. In 1946, he also rejoined the, the staff at CCI. In 1948, he married the former Margaret Glidden of St. Thomas. In 1958, he was appointed head of guidance Department of CCI. Well, he's a novel guidance teacher, I'll tell you. What are you hanging around here for, cousins? You're wasting your time in ours, too. <laughs> Great guidance. In 1964, he was vice principal of CCI. In 1967, he was vice principal of Parkside Collegiate Institute. In 1969, he was principal of Parkside. In 72, he retired as principal of Parkside and from his teaching career. In 1975 to 78, he served as an elected member of the Elgin County Board of Education. In 1979, he received the City of St. Thomas, the St. Thomas Civic Award for Outstanding Citizen of the Year. His award reads, Preserving and Sharing the History of St. Thomas. I received it, the same award the same year, and I don't think George liked that very well. <laughs> in 1981, he was a co-author, along with Wayne and myself, and uh, Brian Sim of uh, St. Thomas, 100 Years of City, the Centennial History of the City of St. Thomas. In 1989, he edited Frank Hunt Essays on Elton County. He wrote and privately printed a brief history of secondary education in St. Thomas as his contribution to the CCI reunion. He was one of the honorees of the CCI reunion. In 1990, he co-edited Garrett Oaks, Tales of a Pioneer. In 1991, he authored, authored and privately printed letters and petitions and other papers concerning the militia companies of Middlesex for 1839. In 1992, he wrote and privately printed The Chisholm Family in Elk County, Myth and Reality. He died on January the 10th, 1997. His funeral from Trinity Anglican Church, St. Thomas. He's buried in the Elmdale Memorial Center, uh, Cemetery, St. Thomas. No, no. You know, he wasn't the only one that he uh, <laughs> said nasty things to. He was the only one. Oh, no. <laughs> he, he was noted for outspoken, and, and not just to, as much as he, uh, he, he, uh, Adored the fairer sex. He was pretty uh, rough on some of the students in school. Well, you you well, too? No, not me. No. I saw him do a couple, and Dean saw him do. He, he well, just. Well, one uh, fellow I went all through school with, he married an R and from the St. Thomas Alvin General, and he met them together. And this fellow had got a doctor by this time, and he looked at him and he said, Why'd you marry such a stupid rod? Huh. Oh, he, he never, he didn't think before he spoke. <laughs> and, and he also had a few run-ins with uh, Garnet Trevithick, the principal, which didn't help him at all in his advancement.
because Trevor think that Kavanaugh ran the school system or the school board did. And and he just he just couldn't keep his mouth shut. <laughs> he, uh, he was a bit of a curmudgeon. Kind of a happy curmudgeon. I love him, but uh, he, he he didn't and then he used to blame me. We, we had a, a, histo a historical society meeting one night at the museum. Duncan McKellop was there, and Duncan and I got into a bit of a verbal argument. Wasn't many of that night. And, uh, <laughs> and anyway, George, George got disgusted and left. Went home, so after the meeting was over, I went over to George's. He opened the door. Sure made a H of yourself tonight, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yeah, there, you can, we can spend all night going through some of the things that George said. It was, uh, wasn't really that, uh, but he was a great guy. He wasn't the best teacher I had. Uh, I, I didn't flourish at that goal out uh, well in math, but i got to say that Lloyd Ockham had to be one of the best math teachers I ever had. He was just, and you know, Lloyd never disciplined anybody. He didn't have to. He started when the class started and he started writing and talking and nobody had a chance to say a word. <laughs> and he just kept right on going. He never had to discipline that. He didn't care if he was dumb or not. Some of the teachers did. <laughs> but but Lloyd is the only teacher I have still alive of public or high school. Lloyd's the only one. My last public school teacher was my very first teacher, Anita Babcock Anthony, and she uh, she's died quite a long, long time ago, but she was a peach too. I really appreciated keeping in touch with my teachers, although I was a terrible student. I just I really thought a lot of my teachers. They were they were the best. And excuse me, I had I didn't have a chance to compare them with other schools, but they, they were a, a good lot. As George said in the 1989 reunion, he said, I don't know what it was about CCI, but they just had something there that was cohesive. And, and it, it, was, it was really much like that. I, I might just read a little read by, this is a little long, but it's a great little story. And some of you have read it, I know. It's uh, entitled, I Won't Be Going to the Grey Cup Game This Year. <laughs> by George Thorman, and I don't know what year it was written. I don't have that information. But anyway, uh, the year that the Rough Riders played the Rough Riders in the Grey Cup. Yeah. Ottawa and Saskatchewan. Well, is that what it was? Yeah, that year, whatever it was. I don't know what year it was. You should remember it. <laughs> Any, anyway, uh, <laughs> his drive a kind of sense of humor was unique and refreshing, and it radiates in this paper. This was never printed until it was printed in the Friends of the Library book. I won't be going to the Grey Cup game this year. That's an ambition I fulfilled in 1951. It was a complete and satisfying fulfillment, and I could never duplicate the excitement and ingenuity we all displayed that far up day in 1951. I wonder if Gord, Gord Walls, who was a phys ed teacher at uh, CCI, or came from Hamilton. He's a wonderful guy, he died way too young. Uh, I wonder if Gord will go this year. Gord, the irrepressible optimist, was the man of destiny that day. At least it was his idea. It all started with my envy. Stu and Pat, and we can't figure out who Stu and Pat are, Stu and Pat had tickets, and when I expressed my envy, Gord said, I've been to every Grey Cup game for the last three years, and I've never paid yet. <laughs> I can get you in, I guarantee it. A piece of cake. Gord still used the Air Force slang. He had that he had just completed his degree in physical education and had joined our staff in St. Thomas. Yes, we were all teachers, those upright purveyors of morality and rectitude, but we stretched our morality on that occasion. God knows we would have purchased tickets if they had been available through regular channels. Tickets were impossible to get and we rationalized. But sneaking in was not really a crime. It was duty bound on all red, red blooded football fans to see one great cup game. But how do we manage it, Garth? Piece of cake. The 
Phys ed, phys ed boys at Toronto always get jobs at the game, and I'm sure to know at least a half a dozen of them. We just walk up and pretend to hand the guy a ticket, or if that doesn't work, Pat and Stu go in, Pat comes out with the two stops, and one of us goes in with Pat. Then Stu comes out with the two stops, <laughs> and, another, and another of us goes in. Repeat the procedure until we're all in. Sounds great. Hell said Gordon, it's always worked before. If it doesn't, we'll just go over the fence. I want to go too, said my way. Piece of cake, said Gordon. The more the merrier. I'll, I'll drive. Next morning we set off, Stu and Pat, with the certitude that nothing could go wrong for them. They had tickets. Merge with high excitement, undiluted because of her confidence in Gore. Lloyd, right there. Lloyd, with uh, his cautious fatalism, estimating in his mathematical way the probabilities of entrance. And I, fluctuating between hope and to fill a lifelong ambition and my natural tendency to anticipate the worst. Being the only Westerner and a rapid one at that, I wore my 10-gallon hat. Not one of those fancy white jobs, but an authentic, dun-colored one worn by a genuine cowboy. I also had a bottle in Mar Mar Mar's carry-all, explaining to her the necessity of alcohol stimulants to fight out the cold and to uphold the Grey Cup tradition. It was my understanding that many people took a suitcase full of liquor. Mar more practical, stuck in a thermos of tea. Secretly, I felt that taking tea to a great cup game was letting the side down. We stopped in Hamilton to see Gordon in laws, much to my perturbation, as I like to get put to places in plenty of time. Gordon explained he had an explanation for, every, for everything. No use getting there too early. Besides, I wanted to say hello to the folks and look at a cup of coffee. The in laws were very agreeable. We had coffee and used the bathroom. Whether it was cold weather or my vague guilt about the ethics of what I was proposing to do, I remember that I visited the bathroom with distressing frequency that morning. We were, we were now six. Harry, an old buddy of Gord's, had been visiting the in-laws, and Gord invited him to come along. Harry had a brand new overcoat and looked very sharp. His elegance made me realize how ridiculous I looked in my 10 gallon hat, and I began to fear the embarrassment I'd feel if I couldn't get into the game and had to spend the day walking around Toronto, little sawed off, wrapped in an oversized hat. My natural pessimism was rapidly subduing my earlier high, expect high expectations for the whole pool party ski. We reached the vicinity of Varsity Stadium about an hour and a half before game time. Park car walked and waited on Bloor Street while Gord made a circuit of the entrances, all of which presumably would be manned by his buddies. While we waited with the growing crowds in the chilly air, I was approached several times by persons who wanted to know if I had any tickets. My cowboy hat was the badge of the Western. I was voicing Cassandra prophecies of failure in our venture. They seemed pretty accurate when we were around to the corner of Fleur and Devonshire. His face told the story. I don't know one person. I can't understand it. <laughs> but his optimism bubbled up. We'll just have to try a different operation. Don't worry. We walked down Devonshire, the narrow street on the west side of Varsity Stadium to the gateway, which Stu and Pat were to use, the <coughs> southernmost entrance. I looked lovely at the two grim-faced ticket takers. Wonder of wonders, I recognized one of them. He was an ROTC type, whom I had met at Emperor Wash Cadet Camp during the summer. I tried to recall whether I had full rank on him. We were so early that practically no one was going in. We spent a few minutes watching a mounted policeman patrolling the sharp brick wall of the south of the stands. Looked about nine feet high, and some enterprising person had played an empty apple box at the base of the wall. When the policeman was at one end of the wall, some desperate individual would try to scale the wall. The policeman would dig in his heels, and his frisky steed would dash along the wall to intercept young monkey gate crashing. We watched for 15 minutes, and only one person made it. I became gloomier and more despondent. Perhaps Lloyd or Harry or Gord could scale the wall, but I would never make it. I was reconciled to disappointment in a true masculine fashion. I put the blame on Mark, silently, of course. If she hadn't insisted on coming, I could have tried the fence or some more desperate measure, such as cutting the tendons of the policeman's horse. <laughs> I would mobilize the policeman while I scaled the wall. But it was an idle dream. Even if the policeman had been on crutches, he could have moved fast enough to intercept such an inept wall climber as I was. Stu and Pat, with tickets in their pockets, expressed their sympathies on our hard luck. 
decided to go in as more early entrants were arriving. They went in the gate, handed over their tickets, which were torn in half, pocketed their stubs, and went in. We waited anxiously for Pat's appearance. He came. He came with the two stubs in his pocket. Well, who's the first to try? I said, boy, you go ahead. Looked like a noblesse oblige, or so I hoped. I was always willing to give a friend the chance to be arrested. <laughs> 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 Lloyd took one of the stubs and he and Pat went to the gate a few moments later went back. What's the matter? He wouldn't let me in. Why not? Said I didn't come out, of, out from the stand. He let Pat in okay. It looks like the fence is the only way. George, you're not going over the fence, said Mark. You'd, Mark, you'd never make it. Considerably shaken by the lack of wifely confidence. I replied indignantly, sure I could, but gave myself an out. I'm afraid I put my back out and I don't want to go through the all that again. Well, she replied, you're not going, and that's that. Look, fellas, I can't do the fence, but you guys go ahead. Mark and I will both see some friends, and we can listen to the game on the radio. Now it was Mark's turn to be noble in her invincible, masterful style. Look, you know that young man at the gate. You try it. If you get in, I'll go into the shop and meet you after the game. What a noble woman, I thought. And I tried to max her magnanimity. Oh, no, I'll stick with you, Mark. I don't really care if I see the game. Be silly. Besides, it's too cold to argue. Go ahead. I'll be all right. I'll stay and watch the other sneak in. Then I'll go and have a cough. Well, okay, if you insist. I took the stub, went to the gate, and entered the slot where the young fellow I knew big was taking tickets. I held out my stub and said, How are things? Fine, he replied. Handed back the stub. Oh, brave young man. Me, you have 12 sons, all great cup players. <laughs> I climbed the stairs and found our honest friends. I sat beside them and said, what do we do when the other ticket holders come? <laughs> Just move closer together, says Stu. What about the others? They're going to jump the fence. What about Mark? Well, she decided not to try. Says she doesn't care that much about a crummy great cup game. Expecting him momentarily to be asked to leave when the ticket holder to arrive, I hunched up uncomfortably. Guilty persons always try to make themselves smaller. The sands were slowly filling. Finally, a party of four Westerners came in to occupy the three seats left in our row. They made no uncomplimentary remarks, but squeezed in and put the small suitcase, one of them was carrying under the seat. Still bothered by my guilt, I had to visit the washroom again. Eventually, the game started, and I was engrossed in the action when Stu gave me a dig in the ribs and said, isn't that Mark down there on the track? Couldn't be. She was going to visit a friend. Well, look down there. I looked. My God, it is Mark. <laughs> I stood up and screamed frantically. Mark! She heard me. Wave gaily and disappeared under the stands, only to reappear in a few moments on the aisle. It was rather embarrassing. Our row was jammed already. I didn't know what to do. But Mark, <laughs> smiling in the most friendly fashion, <coughs> said, excuse me, and came down the road towards me as if her seat were waiting for her. Somehow everyone squeezed right and left, and Mark sat down in the space so miraculously manufactured. How in the world did you get in? Oh, it's a long story. I'll tell you later. Right now I want a cup of tea. How long, how long have you been in here? Where did you get in? How about the others? They jumped the fence. I, it was really exciting. How did you go in? Corruption. What do you mean? Where did you get in? The North Gate, the one the cars come in. Isn't this exciting? Yeah, too bad Regina isn't doing better. It really was too bad. Regina's only offensive threat of being the two towering punts of Glenn Dobbs, the Regina quarterback. Ottawa had scored a touchdown and led 6-2 at halftime. As the teams left the field, Mark recovered her adventures, recounted her adventures. First, I want the boys. I watched the boys get in. Was that exciting? The policeman raced like mad up and down the fence. Curry just made it. The policeman got a hold of his coattail as we blown over and had to let go. I watched a few more people try it, and then I went around the corner to the entrance on Blur Street. There was a crowd around the gate where the cars go in. One short little guy tried to get us organized. He kept showing. Next car, they opened the gate for him. We'll all rush in, okay? When the gate opened, he led the charge, screaming, okay, okay, let's go. But nobody followed him, and a policeman escorted him out. <laughs> Why didn't the other go? The others go. God knows, not the proper amount of spirit, I guess. How did you win? Well, my friend, you get very chummy with people on Grave Cup Day. A rather nice guy he was, too. He said, watch that guy at the gate. He's letting people in for a couple of bucks. Just sidle up to him with the two bucks folded in quarters and slip it in his hand. He pretends to tear the ticket in half and gives you the stuff. He must have made a fortune. Well, I looked in my purse, and I only had a five and a ten. Five bucks is a bargain, less than a ticket cost. 
don't be silly, I wasn't going to pay five dollars. <laughs> I, I asked for change. <laughs> <laughs> the ticket that table says, hell lady, I can't make change. Well, I'm not paying five dollars, you just give me my change. Did he? Yes, he did. <laughs> Pretty embarrassing for him, he dug around his pocket, what a wad he had. Anyway, so three dollars, and here I am. Isn't it exciting? At half time, we debated about leaving our jam quarters for fear that some officious usher might ask us to see our non existent ticket stuff. However, I had counted the number of seats in our short row, and by my calculations, there were four more people in our row than seats. The Westerners on our left must have included a couple of extras. A quick mental calculation as I surveyed the rows in the front and behind, which were just as jammed as our row, convinced me that in our small section of the stands, there must be over 100 people without tickets. <laughs> Such vast numbers of fellow crooks restored my confidence and left our seats just as if we owned them. We went to the washroom again in the hot dog stands. Washroom crowds had to be tolerated, but our hunger wasn't great enough to fight our way to food. Besides, we had the liquid refreshment and the hot tea. We looked around for Gordon, Lord, and Harry. They're probably down on the track, said Mark. We got back to our seats, jammed ourselves together, and gave Stu and Pat. A few minutes later, the Westerners sat down. Their numbers increased by a rather cold and brass-looking young woman who complained bitterly. I wish I'd worn woolens. I damn near froze on a blur street. I finally got in through the skating rink. The guy there was really breaking, in at, breaking it in at two bucks per person. One of Ford's friends, I presume. <laughs> Come on, Regina, I shouted as the team came out on the field for the second half. Let's get going, Dauber. They sorted the Regina fan next to me, standing on the bench and opening a suitcase from which he took a bottle of Hudson Bay rum. He jammed the suitcase under the bench and edged his 40-inch hips into the 10-inch space available on the bench. Two Ottawa touchdowns and two singles gave Ottawa a 22 lead with 10 minutes to go. Then Regina came to life and scored two quick touchdowns and almost got another on the old sleeping, sleeper play. Ottawa managed to hold on scoring another signal to win the game at 21-14. The paid attendance figure was announced at 27,326. I had another 4,000. <laughs> <laughs> we made our way out and at the entrance met Gordon, Lord, and Lloyd, and Harry. It was like a reunion of long separated friends. I congratulated them on their acrobatic feats. Nothing to it, a piece of cake, said Gordon. It was touch and go for me, said the light. Is my back ever cold? I damn near froze for the whole game. I couldn't get warm even in the men's washroom, exclaimed Harry. No wonder your coat is split at the back right up to the collar. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why I buttoned so easily, said Harry. <laughs> Reaching a hand behind his back and grabbing the right half of, the, of his coat. We all laughed uproariously at Harry's discomfiture. At that time, we would have laughed uproariously at anything. Everyone explained how he got in. Mark's entrance was a judge the neatest. Walking to the car, I stopped her and looked back at the stadium. My team had lost, but I'd been to the Grey Cup. We'll do it again next year, says Gordon, but we never did, and I never went again. I wonder if Gordon's going this year. <laughs> Um, the next year I went out and I, and I uh, made the team, 
and uh, I did well in the math at times. But George and I never got along at all that year. It was just awful. It was terrible. So <laughs> we got along fine in school, and I did well in math, but not the basketball court. However, after that year, once he quit hollering at me on the court, and I grew up, he and I became lifelong friends and fellow educators and local historians. I found that George never held grudges, and though he was annoyed with some people along the way, he had a very forgiving way and was very easy to get along with. I guess we both learned something that year, and he reminded me of it years later when we held the basketball reunion in his honor. Over the years, George developed a great, a great a camaraderie with all the players. He coached, he was much loved and respected, and we won many exciting basketball games with him behind the bench. Although, and this is hard to believe, on occasion, he would be ejected from the game, <laughs> or usually sure. Bill Cunningham or something like that, or berating the referees and or using an acceptable language. <laughs> Not for him, but for everybody else. Nevertheless, even the referees loved him. They just thought he was great. George never had a problem with his, and I, started, I called it when we were doing the book together, his down-to-earth language because he used the F word and various others I won't mention in every conversation I ever had with him. <laughs> on occasion when we were up in that room, you were working on that book, he was swearing so bad and somebody come up that stairs, Ann Williams or somebody, and I yeah, said, right. George, George, what the hell's wrong with you? <laughs> <laughs> then he apologized. Then he always apologized after. Uh, However, these were never used when Mark was there. He didn't swear in front of Mark. And <clears throat> Mark was actually my grade five teacher at Bob Tyler Street School, and she always liked me. I was a nice kid. <laughs> she said it was her favorite class, and there were some really good students in there other than me. I wasn't too bad, but. So when George retired, we had a wonderful golf banquet, a wonderful basketball banquet for him at the St. Thomas Golf and Country Club, and we gave him a Carolyn Curtis print, which Bob actually presented to him. I think maybe you still got it. And he absolutely, he absolutely adored that. He really did. Uh, George contributed much to school and to various aspects of society in St. Thomas. And he was considered by everyone who met him as a genuine, fine, intelligent person who they liked being with. That was his main secret, I think. He was fun to be with. He made, as you know, great contributions to the historical society and the military museum, which he loved being a part of. Kay Lemon, also an historical society pillar, did George's typing. In spite of his language and so on, she loved him. She really did. Uh, over the years, I was fortunate to work with George on many projects to use his data, which was excellent, and documents which he collected and willingly allowed me to use them in any way I wanted to, which was really helpful, particularly the railway things. I think he, <clears throat> excuse me, I think he photographed every good document in the uh, library on the railways. And he was right, quite prepared to share them all. He just was just great about it. And we talked about that. I went to go to his house and we laughed about different things. He said, oh, I don't think I really believe that. And I said, oh, okay, well, let's work on that. But it was good. It was great, great times. Um, we spent lots of time with him and with other friends and past students, Paul Baldwin. I think Wayne Neal was there sometimes. Uh, Mark, of course, socially and to work with him on many projects. We took him and Mark one time to uh, a movie over in London and to a restaurant after it was some celebration or whatever. Of course, George didn't have to pay, so this was really big. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we had the greatest time. It was The Last Emperor. I think that I, the only other movie I ever saw was, I don't know, The Rover or something like that. But, but we really had it, and they loved it. And she had a stroke not too long after that, which was unfortunate. Um, the biggest and perhaps most successful as well as most fun project we did was with Don Cousins and Brian Sin in publishing the Centennial Book in 1981. That was a great year with Doug Terrius, Mayor, and Wayne Neal, the alderman in charge of the Centennial events, who commissioned the book and provided monies from the city to publish it. And they also got us a room, which was uh, in an old uh, uh, drugstore on Southwood Street at the corner, and it was warm and it was a cool winter, cool winter that and it was warm Excellent. and it was a great spot. We just had more fun dance pictures, fill all the rooms and, and people would come up and visit us and bring information to us and pictures and I don't think I've ever had a more exciting, interesting time. And of course with George there it was always really a little different, but very interesting. Now, um, 
the last part of this talk, and is, if you don't mind me taking another few minutes, because I think this is really important. I want to discuss one important and significant contribution that George made. In 1966, the Department of Education, um, Ontario, under local consultant Dorothy Stratton, who was a real rooter of his and, and the whole St. Thomas uh, teaching staff, uh, and the Ministry Department had Don Harris, who also was supportive, asked Ontario Boards of Education to develop a centennial project. This was 1966-67, and which would highlight uh, the centennial year. So George accepted the challenge for St. Thomas, and with the board's permission and financial assistance, prepared a local history component of the Great Ten Canadian History Program. This turned out to be a great success, and indeed, the ministry was very proud of George's effort and the St. Thomas program. In fact, the course was so valuable that it lasted for many years and was called the Local History Option. In the early 1960s, George had become very good friends with John Kerr. I don't know how or why that all happened, but John Kerr's father had bought Malahide Farms, or Port Paul, when we were out there, you know, the time. And, uh, Carr's father had purchased the farms in the late 50s, and shortly thereafter, George and John Carr became very, very good friends, and they, uh, they were very interested in promoting Colonel Collis' life and the historical value of the old home. And as early as 1964, Carr had printed a really elegant brochure, which I have one at home, about Fort Talbot and the old home. It's excellent. It goes through all the different steps of the home of Talbot, went back to England, and the Carey's wife. Um, we finished the place that he would never go back and live, all that kind of stuff. It was good. Um, so anyway, um, where did I get in here? Because of Kerr's interest and willingness to make Port Talbot the history available, he and George began to study in depth and promote the story of the Talbot settlement. Their interest led to a Talbot history revival, and a big one, and a lot of fun in this area and quite reminiscent of what earlier local historians and societies had done. Um, a, a pioneer tradition called the Talbot Anniversary was revived, and there were some really fine dinners and celebrations organized to once again celebrate Talbot's, Talbot's arrival and his life in Elgin. Fred Coyne Hamill, professor of history at the University of Michigan, author of the Talbot Regime, and that's the classic book on Talbot, and he, he was related to James Coyne, who was already described here, historian, <coughs> pre-runner, and a, one of our best historians, no doubt the best one. Uh, and he spoke on, they spoke, and we had celebrations and so on, but that particular night, that was at the Grand Central, it was a, an excellent night, people were dressed, the people in the middle were all dressed in the top of the tire as people of the top of the settlement. And George was in the home, of course. And then John Carr was, uh, I don't know who he was, but uh, it was one of the big wheels anyway. But the whole night went through as a pioneer night, and it was just a terrific program. And uh, there was uh, people had great costumes on, and they sang, and they performed the old music, and it was just terrific. Now, there were only about two or three of them. The third one I remember was when we actually brought Talbot and Mamie Burwell and uh, these other characters from the past back to life. And we had these, the Elgin Historical Society uh, anniversary dinner was at the golf course. And I remember Mayla Burrell actually rode up to the golf course on a horse. In fact, it was John Roth. Oh, John Roth. Yeah, John Roth. Yeah. And he's sitting, he's sitting right there. <laughs> and that was such a great thing. Everybody came at Tyron and we had a terrific uh, day. It was a beautiful day. He sat up at the Scott Scott was bringing. Yeah. And all the horses got there. And all these horses were there, and, uh, and everybody's in these period costumes, and it was just a terrific night. Now, I don't know what happened to that. There was another one in uh, uh, 2000 when we had the, uh, the, uh, the dinner out at Port Talbot, but I don't think there's been too many since her. Or, uh, 2003. 2003. Yeah, and that was the one that was out at Port Talbot. But, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's something to think about. Um, the Talbot Estate, the Talbot Estate became the keystone of the local history course. And George had been given money for books and supplies as well as field trips. So the students visited Port Talbot and toured the grounds and buildings and were regaled by stories and myths about, about Talbot by John Carr. 
or his father. They were an excellent host, and the kids were really excited about it, and they liked having visitors. Now, some of the stuff was a lot of baloney, but it was still very really nice, you know. Uh, I don't think there was ever a ghost at all running around there, but John Clark kind of claims, I don't know, it was out for supper maybe, and that he'd seen one or heard one. The students then visited other historical sites in the county to make historical findings and do research accordingly. Students loved these trips. The literary results they produced were amazing. I've got some excellent essays at home that were done by grade 10 students who would be worthy of uh, grade 13 work now and maybe even adult work. They were excellent. The kids really worked hard at it. The course was one of the most successful I ever taught, and most of the students loved it. Even today, I will have a graduate uh, reminisce with me about the tours and the stories of our own area. The course used a great deal of primary source material, which George got and accumulated and gave to other schools, and many visual aids and reference books, and was a great contribution to the school libraries. But it also taught the students how to really study history, because they had to go out and find stuff, read about it, see the things, and then analyze it and come back with a report, which was really good. Uh, today, the course has been moved to the elementary school level, but I feel the credit for this aspect of appreciating and learning about the pioneer period has to be given to George Thorman, and it should be accredited to him for laying that foundation. So sometime I think that will all come back. We keep trying. We can't get into Port Talbot, but I think he can't ever get back, you know, that particular level of history. But they were great times with him, and that course was wonderful. He even had that television series. Uh, on Talbot Burrell and all of us, and just excellent. And that stuff, I think, is still available out at uh, the museum. I think Mike told me that once. So I thought I'd leave that with you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's become available online. Oh, I'm, is it really? Yes. Oh, that's great. I'm, I'm putting out episodes, and there'll be a few more episodes in the coming weeks. We, cousins and I had hair then. I <laughs> 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 I'm just going to skip around here a little bit. And, um, George, uh, this fall, and uh, I'm arguing a bit, I think uh, uh, that he was born on the 16th, but uh, in September. But anyway, uh, that's only one day. Uh, he uh, will be 100 this year. He was George is an outstanding, outstanding man, and uh, I was involved in basketball with him and many other things. And uh, uh, after Mark died, he was coach, and that was in the early, that was in the early part of uh, that year, uh, that year. And we had a walking group, group. six uh, chappies that sort of enjoyed uh, going to British Isles. And uh, because we knew George was by himself and so on, we uh, invited him to come along with us, made seven, and the other George, George number two, which was George Disbrough. So after the first year, uh, we went to uh, Cornwall and Devon. Uh, George didn't write, write any letters that time, but when he came home after the, uh, the second year, this was 1989, uh, he started sending a form letter to each one of the Walker's widows, as he called them. And some of them really are hilarious, and they're so well done. And I'm just going to pick a few little things out, because the night's rolling down, and there's just some smart stuff there, but some wonderful stuff. And this particular one uh, was, I think, the first one that he did, and that was in 89. And we went to, uh, uh, went to Wales, and we went to the uh, Isle of Man. And this is George. Dear Lois, I feel that it is my duty to report to you on the conduct of your spouses during the recent sojourn in Wales and the Isle of Man. I am happy to report that there, were, there was no scandalous, nefarious, infamous, or improper behavior of any kind. When you consider that every noon hour and every evening was spent in pubs which were filled with nubile young women and men on the make, it was a pleasure to observe the impeccable behavior of your chivalrous Canadian <laughs> Both Brian and 
and George, that's Bolt and Gisbro. Both Brian and George found car buffs everywhere and revealed under persuasion and coaxing they were very great success as car dealers. Robert, of course, will talk to anyone. He represented the acme of the garrulous and non-stop talker. Indeed, he spoke monologues with more people than the rest of us put together. He also had interesting discussions with several sheep <laughs> and a Manx cat, as well as a five-minute conversation with an embossed pillar on the bar. <laughs> Ron, the ancient combatant, had no difficulty in meeting other vintage veterans with red noses and bloodshot cheeks and fought the war several times as far as Bergenop Zoom. McDonald, the new boy, was assigned to me. That's the late Jack McDonald. And was enthusiastic about even the bloody hikes. <laughs> George never liked to do any of the walking. And one time he took a taxi to catch up on <laughs> <laughs> one time he took me on a tour of the store, similar to my last, and he enjoyed himself immensely. Bill, a genial in indefatigable mentor, driver, and leader, produced the usual fine assortment of pubs and spent most of his evenings advising people on how to get to Aglada, Rivers, Manitoba, or Ujiji. Indeed, no, sorry. they were all most charitable, when he's talking about the group he went with, they were all most charitable, and George loved that, of course, and looked after my simple wants, such as malt scotch, or crepes, Suzette's, Disbro was the champion philosopher, closely followed by Farley. But he did it more graciously than Farley, who would say, What do you have, you old fart, you? <laughs> <laughs> and at the bottom it says, P.S., will you give, please give Bob the enclosed receipt for 20 pounds? I didn't have my receipt book on the plane. And here's the receipt up there, of course. The inference here is that. Uh, we paid George off to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> uh, here's, here's 91. <clears throat> this is short here. Generally, I found their conduct. He always starts out by, I feel it is my bounden duty to give you a description of your noble husband's activities on our annual trip to England. Being hard of hearing, with eyesight failing, and a tendency to go to bed early. I found it impossible to maintain 24-hour surveillance. <laughs> Generally, I found their conduct impeccable, but I am not convinced that they are the stallions they think they are. I would suggest you have them consult a specialist. <laughs> um, Ron was the only one who came close to having an affair. A couple of cabs, names known but not to be revealed, but a life-size stone angel in his bed. But Ron was too smart and too sober to be deluded. However, he is going to read the Stone Age and be better prepared for the next time. Any of you who feel the need for counseling or a fuller report, don't hesitate to ask. My evenings are free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving along, so they try to Please find and close my annual report on our European trip in this 92. This will be my last report, as I am now no longer capable of maintaining surveillance on such a tricky set of rascals. <laughs> and then, what he would do with each of these letters is also invite us to come to his summer cocktail party. And he invited many other people to, but he invited the walkers. I'm going to a cocktail party on Wednesday, July the 15th, from 4 to 6, for the convenience of those who work, I will extend the hour to 7. No dinner will be served. If your husbands have to work, bring a friend instead. <laughs> I will provide a sufficient amount of food and drink in addition to kangaroo gin in honor of Ron's blessed aunt. I don't know what that was all about. It's something that had to... Moving on. Uh, this this is, it says to the ladies club, and this is 94. The new addition was Fred Anderson, who outdressed our two bold brummels, Disbro and Barnes. Fred had a different outfit each day. He only had a couple of bags, in brackets, valises, that is. The mystery is, how can he pack so much in so little space? Perhaps he did not wear undergarments. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, having, I'm having a cocktail party on Wednesday, July the 13th. You may bring 
the lunch you married or a suitable companion. <laughs> Do not expect dinner and please leave at or before six. The all the all this was the last city for that. Substitutes will be welcome. At six o'clock, I'm having the house and veranda treated with a dangerous insecticide. <laughs> Therefore, leave well before six. If Farley should attend, he is most welcome to stay. <laughs> <laughs>
whose uh, husband was dead then. Her sister was coming down to visit. So she invited George to come back and see Sheila. And uh, only invited, said, bring one other of your group. Didn't invite all of us, only one. Nobody would go. We just, uh, we said to Barney, you're the oldest, you should go. We said, no, unless you guys are going, I'm not going. So we, we dropped George off, we go to separate. And uh, well, about 9, 3, 10 o'clock, sitting in, uh, in the room by myself. There's a tap on the door. And uh, oh, but then there's George. I said, oh, come in, George. And uh, I said, how are things going? He said, well, oh, pretty well. And I said, well, what'd you think of Sheila? And he said, well, she's certainly not as young as she used to be. And she mumbled and mumbled her way up on I said, well, what did, what did she uh, think about you? And I never asked her. <laughs> okay, let me conclude. We, uh, Don and I spent uh, quite a bit of time uh, putting George's estate together. And uh, George died in, uh, in January. We uh, took us quite a while, Don. It was about May by the time we got it organized. Um, Don went to college the empties we had there, and there were quite a number of cases. We decided we should have uh, the George Stover cocktail party in the summer before the cottage was gone. Uh, so it was a matter of writing a letter to everybody, uh, George's friends plus the walkers. Dear friend, and this is dated uh, May the 30th, 1997. I will be holding my annual summer cocktail party at 173 Harrison Place, Port Stanley on Saturday, June the 14th. From 3.30 to 6 p.m. This will be the final one as the property has been literally sold out from under me. It went dirt cheap. For personal reasons, I was unable to accompany the walkers to the Chapel Islands. They are home now with many stories, all obvious fabrications, covering up their unacceptable activities. I will be unable to give my usual comprehensive report to the walkers' widows. Since in future you will not have my guidance, fellows must grow up and be responsible for your erratic behavior. I wish to thank Don and Mark Cousins for their great service to me at the arena. Young Mark is a real bright light and stood out when compared to his father and him as they He must have got a good helping of genes from his mother Linda. The party, albeit at my expense, will be hosted by my not-so-young nephew Steve and my friend Farley, who, because he set the date, will unfortunately likely attend. <laughs> you need an RSVP, I will know. The same rules apply as usual. Two drinks per guest, minimal finger food, and the door is locked at six. There will be no exceptions. And as best this is my last party, as it has become very expensive for a retired teacher and a small pension until we all gather again somewhere. <clears throat> Remember, I will always be watching over you, my dear friends, determined yours. <laughs>
not much more. You can shoot from one end into the other. So this this demands special attention. How do you combat a small play in a small tune like this? So George's strategy was to play a four-man backcourt and a one-man under the other basket. Now that meant the the decision had to be made by the other coach. Is he going to keep a man back there underneath the basket to prevent the um, throw into him? Or does he play uh, one man back to guard him and four others? In other words, he sort of disrupts the flow of the game. But George is always looking for things like that. Uh, I have a lot of instances from working with George. We worked together in the, in the summer quite often measuring tobacco for the tobacco board. And uh, George, George, George has his own uh, had his own uh, idiosyncrasies. Uh, anyway. We used to take our lunch. This one day we were in, uh, back in the back field or parked in a sw swampy area. Lots of frogs were around. So, being me, I grabbed a frog, stuck it in George's lunch mail. <laughs> <laughs> I know George never forgive me <laughs> because George had the habit of coming back partway through the morning, opening up his lunch box and taking a, having a bite to eat. Well, he did the same. <laughs> this time, he opened up the frog. <laughs> George, I don't think he ever forgave me because he, he took his lunch pail and threw it, put <laughs> lunch in it. <laughs> I, I had taught George into picking up his own lunch pail but he wouldn't eat lunch. One <laughs> <laughs> other, yeah. other thing about George, there, there are a lot of things that, uh, with George. Remember George started the basketball players, you remember Wayne started the little Abner League? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that, that's where that went on for many, many years. He, uh, Pardon? Newnar. Newnar, yeah. yeah. And he took kids in grade nine, never played basketball, and taught them a few fundamentals, and then had a, a tournament, more or less. Uh, George is always in the teaching mood. Uh, what else can I say about George? There's many things. Think of something nice. Pardon? Think of something nice. Something nice. nice. Think of something nice. I don't know if I can do that or not. <laughs> 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 George was a great guy to work with. I worked with him uh, when he came back from overseas. When he came back to St. Thomas to teach again. And uh, we coached basketball together. George never coached football, but George always had, had the had the students in his mind, though. Yeah. I don't know what else to say. Well, I think that's that's.